Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us this evening for another one of our Military Aviation Museum webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum. Um, our guest tonight is a legendary air-to-air -air photographer. He's been inducted into two different aviation halls of fame, um, and one of his most proud accomplishments was being named to Flying's 51 Heroes of Aviation. And uh, Paul is also just an incredible person. He gives so much of his time, his energy, his enthusiasm uh, to the broader aviation community. And tonight's program is one such example of that. Uh, I reached out to Paul through a mutual friend uh, to find out if he might share with us uh, some of his tips and tricks to creating just phenomenal air-to-air -air images of warbirds, of general aviation aircraft. And uh, owing to his generosity of spirit, Paul has said yes, and he'd love to be here with us and and to share some of his incredible stories and life experiences. So without too much more from me, uh, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest, Paul Bowen. Paul, take it away. Evening, everyone. This is your resident legendary photographer, um, only because there are so few of us who do what I do. So uh, I, I know that there are a number of my friends who, uh, who are listening, probably people I owe money to, and are trying to keep track of my whereabouts during these days. Um, I hope that, uh, that you all have gotten caught up with your gardening as I have, and some of the projects that we, again, never had time to do before. Um, having this evening's presentation uh, offered to me also allowed me to go through and organize some images that I hope to uh, share with you during the evening. You know, we've all attended evening events where we've constantly looked at our watches to see how much longer we're gonna have to sit here listening to this. Of course, you can come and go as you want this evening. However, hopefully I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm at the end of the evening and I have a great four hour presentation. Um, uh, however, that's not what you're gonna see tonight. Um, but I hope at the end you, basically feel, well, this hasn't been a wasted evening at all. I learned something, I had some fun, and who amongst us doesn't love looking at aviation photography? So this uh, first image that you see, my brother, who's a much more creative artist than I am, uh, illustrated this for fun for me, and I try to open up um, every one of my presentations with it. Hopefully there's nothing symbolic about the smoke in the background. Um, but uh, but this is uh, one of the great air-to-air -air adventure beginnings. Now, this evening, I'm basically going to challenge you to find someone else who has a better job in aviation than I do. Um, I've been at it for, oh, I don't know, 45 years or so, and, uh, and, and have had the opportunity to see incredible airplanes, to travel the world, to meet incredible people, uh, heroes, who you'll get a chance to see some of the pictures of uh, as we go along. But basically, keep in mind that I have the best job in aviation. Um, a quick shout out to uh, Kermit. Uh, Kermit's the Renaissance man. He can do anything. Um, you know, he built his first airplane when he was in high school. And we're not talking about a remote control kind of airplane. He's a national aerobatic champion and and uh, he he can do everything he he sings he writes he uh, he's just uh, he's amazing he was a presenter two nights ago and if you didn't get a chance to hear it you might want to go into the archives and uh, and see some of Kermit's uh, uh, adventures uh, including him flying Ina the Macon Bell this uh, early model P51 which I'm sorry I can't remember if it was a model a B or a C model but uh, if you'll notice the canopy, it's a lot different from um, some of the uh, P-51s that you're gonna see a little bit later in the presentation. So again, a little shout out too to Jerry Yagen, who's, um, who I first met at Sun and Fun many years ago in Lakeland. And he's uh, basically the, the person who made the Military Aviation Museum what it is today. And, uh, and I had a chance um, to shoot him in his P-40 Warhawk. Um, and, uh, and before he went up and fly, to fly, uh, here is Tex Hill, the legendary flying tiger. And those of you who know anything about um, 
historical aviation um, will recognize the name Tex Hill and the American Volunteer Group who flew the Tiger Mouths um, uh, P-40s as you see here with Jerry flying um, during the uh, prior to our entry into World War II. Um, so thanks to, uh, to Jerry for the incredible collection that he has. So this evening, again, you're going to see a lot of the platforms that I shoot from and, uh, and some of the images that I've captured, some of the great pilots and all whom I've flown with and gotten to know. But in the meantime, I think it's important that you're dedicating what will be about an hour and a half of your evening to, uh, to someone you may not know too well. And, uh, and those of you who do know me, thank you for watching anyway. Um, this is my gang, except um, this was a few years ago and we've added Charlotte, who's two and a half now. The boys are, uh, are older and, uh, and here they are. I started them out early um, around uh, airplanes. Um, they love airplanes. There's a La Patron shirt that's uh, Rod Lewis's uh, F7F, and uh, and they just they love being around airplanes and and uh, are uh, uh, a delight to my wife Gail and me. Um, I'm I'm going to share something now that hopefully I I can do uh, fairly easily. Um, this is my, my bride, Gail. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Having just a little difficult time. Can you say something? <clears throat> About our trip? Um, <laughs> excuse me for going public uh, tonight, but uh, we, we found out a few weeks ago that Gail has breast cancer. And we're just uh, just going public with it. Uh, I promise I won't do this the whole evening. But uh, my apologies to those of our friends who are listening, who uh, uh, who we've not contacted uh, specifically and individually. But for those of you who've gone through cancer or someone close to you who has, you understand how uh, demanding and stressful it can be. The good news, and I'm just going to share this and then move on. The good news is uh, it's a stage one and uh, she'll have a year of chemo and a, a double mastectomy and uh, everything else in our life is great. And um, so uh, we appreciate prayers and notes and concerns. And um, if each of you would send a thousand dollars to me, that would be great too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or or red wine, whichever is easier. <laughs> but we have great support and we do. uh, we're doing okay. Great family, and we're doing fine. I'm I'm the softy, and uh, uh, Gail's probably doing better than I am um, with it. But uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, we're we're doing okay, and uh, and we'll we're going to get through this. We'll get through it. Yeah. So thanks for bearing with me on that. But uh, for those of you who haven't had the luxury or the um, the wonderful experience of meeting Gail, um, you, uh, you have a treat ahead of you. And um, for those of you who do know Gail, you understand why it's such a difficult time for us. So, um, so there, there will be a carrying bridge that we've just set up. We're just going public this week. And uh, uh, contact me uh, personally and I'll, I'll get you that information. Okay. So, if there's a place I'd rather be than up in an airplane, it's out on a surfboard. And I grew up surfing in Southern California and uh, took this a couple of years ago in Maui. And uh, it's not photo, it's not retouched, um, but that's, uh, that's my background. The Southern California surfer uh, went to UC Santa Barbara, uh, got a degree in zoology and um, had, uh, uh, I guess, mental issues, moved to Wichita in the early 70s. and um, and, and, uh, yet I'm still, uh, you know, someday I'm going to be out on the surfboard with a walker probably. And I don't think I'm too far from that. So my very first commercial assignment was shooting OJ Simpson, receiving the keys to a Skyhawk for having been the rusher of the year. From there, 
my career went downhill. I'm officially a commercial photographer. So my primary business is shooting for the manufacturers for their uh, brochures, ads, websites, etc., for their marketing for their new airplanes. However, I got hooked about 20 years ago on warbirds and, uh, and do that for passion. The general aviation folks keep the lights on and the warbird stuff keeps the passion going. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of both as we go into the evening. I'm not gonna be very technical with the, uh, with the camera gear, um, but I'm gonna show you, this is my, my traveling bag. I don't check it in. I carry it on, it fits in the overhead. And although this was shot a few years ago and the cameras have changed, the basic idea is uh, two camera bodies. I'm using the 5D SR Canon 51 megapixel cameras. They're incredible. And, um, and then I'll, I'll normally take 100, 400, a 70 to 200, a 28 to 105, and oh, something like a 16 to 35 or 40 or something like that. Pardon me, along with uh, a fisheye, a strobe, uh, batteries, chargers, polarizing filters, um, cable release. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, uh, some uh, carabiners with webbing. That's what I use as my harness, um, gloves, and knee pads. And that last thing that's kind of interesting that you all might want to consider packing uh, in, in your get gadget bags is it's a heavy, heavy duty trash bag. And uh, if it rains, I can cut a hole in it and slip it over me. If, uh, if it's dirty and I have to lie down in, in grass or dirt or whatever, I can spread it out it's, and it doesn't take up any space or weight. So that's my basic camera gear. So when it comes time to do the air-to-air -air photo shoots, we always say safety first. And as you can see, there's no photo worth taking any undue risk to achieve. And part of the, the safety is that you put together an incredible team. Um, you know, I have over a thousand magazine covers. I stopped counting, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And although my name appears on them, the reality is that the, the whole team that makes the photo shoots happen should have their name on those pictures. Uh, especially the pilots. The pilots really are the heroes of any photo shoot. And I've had a chance to fly with great, great pilots. So the first thing we'll do is we'll have a briefing. And as you can see here, <clears throat> we'll discuss the artistic hopes and the pilots will basically tell me how we can achieve them safely. So a briefing in this case was uh, with the Learjet folks. We had a whole gaggle of people, including the marketing and advertising people, as well as two pilots for each of the three target Learjets um, and the pilots and crew for the photo platforms that we were shooting. We were shooting from uh, both a B-25 and a Periscope equi equipped Learjet for the video. In this case, we were simply going to be shooting a couple of P-51 Mustangs out of an OV-10 Bronco. And it's a much smaller briefing scenario, but same kind of thing. We discuss all the, the uh, preliminary uh, stuff that, uh, that we have no idea, you know, what, what we might encounter. Um, sometimes you encounter birds and you want to discuss what you're going to do if you, if you run into any birds. Okay, the platform airplane is usually in the lead and that's the airplane that I'm in. Um, we hopefully will take off a door or a, a remove a window or a tail cone on the B-25 or something that allows me to not have to shoot through any glass. Um, there are times when we can shoot through glass and I'll show you how we, uh, how we approach that. The target plane, <clears throat> um, is uh, is is basically in most cases forming up on us, and it's in a sense the responsibility in a very simplified way. The responsibility of the platform planes pilot 
to not run into anything that's out in front of us. And I know some of you I've flown with, um, I don't know who else listening now, but um, a, a lot of you have never been involved in any formation flying and don't realize how difficult it is. And interestingly enough, you know, most pilots spend their careers trying to stay away from other airplanes, whereas we're trying to do just the opposite. And, uh, and so we have to have formation qualified or experienced pilots or the chute will simply never be successful or safe. So the lead plane is going to fly smoothly and not hopefully run into anything that's out in front of us, be it another airplane or a mountain or the ground or um, clouds or uh, anything that might ruin our day. And the target airplane or the plane that has formed up on us, it's their job basically not to hit us. Um, so we appreciate the pilots, especially the pilots that are flying off of us. So here's a, uh, an example of one of the platforms. I'm gonna show you probably about 10 different platforms that I shoot from or have shot from. This happens to be the tail end of an OV-10 Bronco. I think there are only one or two in civilian hands and it's a twin engine as you can see uh, airplane, we are getting ready for sunrise. Um, I'm facing aft, you're looking forward. And uh, once we get up in flight, I'm going to scoot back. I have a tethered um, harness on. Uh, I kiddingly say that my uh, the other end of the harness is tethered to my pilot's ankle. So if I go out, you know, I'm, I'm not going out alone. Um, but it's long enough that it'll take me back to the smiley face that you see back there. Um, and then the target airplane will come up behind us. In this case, it was Lee Lauterbach from Stallion 51 with Crazy Horse 2 um, pulling up at sunrise. We're in a slight left turn and hence a little bit of bank. I try to put some diagonal movement to the wings. I, I really get bored with planes that are flying straight and level. So even if I tilt the camera, um, I want to add a little bit of diagonal movement to the uh, to the shot. So this is a shot where I'm actually doing a little fill flash and I'll show you how I do that in a bit. Again, I'm not going to be too technical. I'm not talking to a camera club um, and I recognize some of your pilots. Some of you were dragged to this and uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, wanted some popcorn and, and, uh, and a beer. Um, but uh, but I'm going to try to stay a little bit technical, but not too much. So full flash um, and, uh, and shooting just prior to sunrise. And that's the reflection off the metallic side that gives that look. This also from the OV-10 Bronco. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, fill flash at sunrise. So you can see we're in a turn, uh, which gives a lot more movement to the plane rather than if we were just flying straight and level. And it gives me a big change in the background, you know, if you're flying and making a standard rate turn, and I apologize, I'm not a pilot, by the way, although I have about 25 legally logged hours from many years ago, um, I, I don't remember what the actual bank angle is of a standard rate turn, but it's not, it's not too great. But if you do a standard rate turn, you'll make a complete circle in two minutes. It doesn't matter how fast you're going. It's just a bigger circle if you're going faster. And so... Um, by doing orbits in formation, I get a different background, different lighting, and it still makes the plane look like it's really moving. Here's another platform um, that happens to be a helicopter, and you can tell by the way I'm dressed that it gets pretty chilly. You can imagine the door's off, and we're in San Francisco, and this was my target. So the question was, um, what lens am I going to use to shoot the A380? And so I had three cameras, all with different lenses, because I had no idea how close he was going to get to us, because we were fairly stationary, and he flew by us and, uh, and kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I had all kinds of different lenses ready to capture uh, the, the, uh, this monster flying by. Well, talking about helicopters, last summer, Gail and I went up to Anchorage and shot uh, Oni's posse. That's Tony Oni in the foreground. He was one of the first guys to bring 
a helicopter up to Anchorage. And uh, these are all sons and friends who have, uh, have joined him in owning uh, some helicopters. There's a Bell 407, they're all Bell. Uh, there's a Bell 407 uh, on the left-hand side that we used as a platform. And we flew off to a back country area that was uh, owned, a landing strip and area was owned by one of the pilots. This is the beautiful background that we had to work with. And we uh, went cruising through the, uh, the areas, uh, shooting past glaciers and all. Pretty, uh, pretty fun, pretty fun and flying with great pilots. So speaking of helicopters, um, we, uh, I had another chance to do a, a shoot that's kind of fascinating. You may recognize uh, Styles and Sully here. Um, and, uh, and we were at Oshkosh a few years ago. Um, and here's the helicopter that the empty seat is where I sat. And we were going to do an interesting shoot because um, Jim Slattery's PBY and Jim, what a great guy he is. And he has a, a wonderful collection in fact, that's uh, that's at the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs, and um, and he had his PBY up at Oshkosh, and we took off to uh, to fly with Sully in the right seat. Here you can see a kind of a close-up shot of him as we headed toward Lake Winnebago for Sully's second water landing. Not quite like the Hudson. This is afterwards, um, and uh, uh, you can see uh, all smiles with uh, Styles on the left and and Jim Slattery um, between him and and Sully, and then joined by Shondi Tucker, the the uh, well noted uh, and aerobatic pilot and and great guy. Well, another platform is the T6 or the SNJ. Um, you can see the canopies open there. Um, I did some shots of it, but I also did some shots from it. And here's uh, kind of an interesting thing. Um, and and uh, Mark Peterson's uh, uh, in uh, in Diamondback, one of one of his Mustangs. I want you to look at the props on this. And and to be quite frank, shooting jets is easier, I think, than shooting prop planes because um, here you can see I used a fairly fast shutter speed, probably a 500th of a second, um, maybe somewhere between a 250th and a 500th, I'm not quite sure. And, and to me, it's a little objectionable, but I, uh, I did this on purpose because look at the props in this shot and then in this one. And so I used a slower shutter speed to still show that it's a four bladed prop, um, but it's, it, it's a, to me, it's a little more pleasing than the almost frozen prop. And, uh, and so what I, what I do when I'm shooting is sometimes I'll alter the shutter speed so as to uh, alter the prop blur. Um, the problem is that you're flying, in this case, in an SNJ that's vibrating a lot, and I can't use a real slow shutter speed. Um, so I hate, depending on the platform you're shooting from, also determines what kind of shutter speed you might want to use. And I, uh, I, I kind of play around. You usually get a full arc at about an 80th of a second, depending on the RPMs and how many blades and so forth. But, but that gives you, a, a, it's pretty safe for sure at a 60th of a second, but, but you're going to toss some of your images, depending if you're using a stabilized lens or a stabilizer on the camera. So this again, <clears throat> same shoot, but we're doing circles. And so you get front lit and back lit. So here are a few more examples. This again happens to be Slattery's um, F3F. I just love this airplane. And, um, and we were shooting with Bill Clare's, uh, out of Bill Clare's uh, uh, B25 and um, and look at the prop on this, and then the prop on that, and again, the full arc. So I'll go back and show you those again. 
So you can see it's depending on the lighting um, and the color of the prop and so forth determines as to how much it really shows up and whether it really affects the picture or not. In this case, I really like the full arc. I think because of the radial engine also, um, it just makes, makes for a nice shot. We do tend to always shoot first light and last light. And, um, and so uh, we get the most variety of backgrounds. You know, another interesting thing that happens in this picture probably shows it pretty well is that if you think about the first hour of light and the last hour of light, um, the, the, the light is hitting the airplane pretty full on. Um, and when I show you some other pictures later of side views of airplanes, it'll even become more evident. But, um, but it's the background that's quite a bit darker now because every tree, every bush, every blade of grass, every pebble, everything down there is casting a shadow. And so the ground is darker simply because of the cast shadows down below. And so the plane stands out better against the darker background than it would say at noon when just the top half of the airplane is being lit and the ground in a sense has minimal cast shadows. And so, um, so the tonality of the airplane and the background become uh, way closer. So here's another example too of a faster shutter speed. And yet here's an example. Um, this was a great morning that we were shooting, by the way, because you can see the variety of backgrounds we've got in a short area, close area in the Colorado Springs area. But because of where the light was coming from on the airplane, the prop hardly shows at all. So it really doesn't matter. And there are times when a well-lit prop, even with a beautiful arc, can be distracting to the beauty of the lines of the airplane. So, um, so there's again a case where the light's from behind and so it's not lighting up the prop. And so it's not, in a sense, distracting from the beauty of the lines of the, of the airplane. I do wanna show you one thing. Um, and I do this when I'm, when I'm shooting, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the backgrounds, I'm looking at the light on the airplanes, I'm looking at the angle of the wings. I'm, there's so much going on. And depending on what airplane we're shooting, we may be going anywhere from 150 to 200 miles an hour um, and, um, and so in this case, if you look at the lower part of the nose, it kind of blends in against that darker row of trees. Whereas I like this shot a lot better because the darker part of the lower part of the nose plays really well and separates well from the background. So I'm keeping that in mind. Um, and I don't really care what happens to the back part of the airplane, um, because your eye usually goes to the nose of the airplane, and uh, at least when they're in trail like this. So again, this is from the B-25 and, um, and making left-hand orbits. So <clears throat> I do like shooting down, and in this case, again, um, I'm directing the pilot through headset. I've got communication with my pilot, and he relays what, I want the target plane to do. So I may say low at six o'clock and, and, uh, and if I've made a stupid request or don't know that there's a tower coming up, then my pilot can filter that request before dropping the target plane down real low at our six o'clock. But here he is at six o'clock low and then I'm gonna move him up a little higher and then move him up even higher. Now here's a case where he's lost sight of us and that's a no-no except that we briefed it and he's pulling through that position. He's, he's quite a ways back and I'm using a little bit of a telephoto lens. So normally you would not have him in trail and be blind. So, uh, so for those of you uh, extra safety conscious folks, um, that's correct, he can't see us, but it was only for a, a split second. So uh, here's Gail again, and, and sometimes Gail gets to go with me on some of the shoots. Um, this is Arnie Itzkowitz, a friend of mine um, who's now living in the Maryland area, but he was living in uh, New Jersey and he does a lot of video work. And you can see the camera that he has uh, where he and I are gonna share his Bonanza. In fact, he owns the Bonanza, um, but was not flying at this time. And we were gonna be doing a shot up and down the Hudson. 
um, hopefully staying above the water. And uh, Arnie and I were um, we're going to share the, the platform with his gyro equipped video camera there. And here we go down, down the Hudson. Now, because I never know how the images are going to be used later, I usually take a slightly wider lens. I mentioned a 24 to 105, and then more of a telephoto, the 70 to 200 on two different bodies. Again, the five DSRs, which are 51 megapixels, so they're monsters. Um, and we'll try to shoot a wide shot, and then I'll put that camera down quickly and, and then do a, you know something more close up, more telephoto. So this is a case where the prop is a is you know it's a full arc, but it's almost a little distracting to the lines of the airplane. I love the shot, but but um, I'm not sure that the full arc really adds anything positive to this shot. From the Bonanza, and the Bonanzas are are authorized to take the double doors off of the right hand side of the airplane. Um, from the Bonanza, the 36 model Bonanzas, we can also make low passes over runways and do these pull-ups like you see here with this King Air. We also used uh, Arnie's uh, Bonanza for uh, shooting the AW409, um, which was, uh, was pretty fun. He again shot video while I shot stills. From the Bonanza, although this is not Arnie's plane, um, we're able to do the pull-ups that many of you have seen. Um, we didn't actually take off together uh, from this airport. We did a low pass across the runway, and I called a pull-up. Um, my close friend Ed McElhenney is flying from the right seat in this case. The owner of this airplane is in the left seat, although a qualified pilot was not formation experience. So Ed, with his military background, um, flew from the right seat. <laughs> Ironically, we were using his Bonanza, um, uh, the uh, 36TC uh, turbocharged model to actually do the, the pull up here. So from that same airplane, we can shoot the Mid-Continent uh, Instruments Kodiak uh, locally. Uh, they're based here in Wichita as, as am I. And shooting down on the plane and then across at the airplane so you could read their logos and stuff. But there was a, a cloud bank off in the distance, so we climbed up on top of the cloud bank and, uh, and got some shots by, um, and I'm sorry, again, I'm not a pilot and I get these terms confused, but it's either skidding or slipping or yawing or something. Um, but by kicking our tail around a little bit and flying straight and level, um, I can actually get a head-on shot out of the Bonanza by putting a little bit of a longer lens on. In this case, we're actually going straight and level, but I've tilted the camera to get that, that angle um, that, I again, I think adds a lot to the picture. You can see by the clouds that that we're actually going straight and level at this point. So Ed and I have, have flown a lot together and, and uh, one early morning um, we got uh, out at, uh, in the Wichita area, there's a Stearman Field northeast of Wichita where there are, I've lost track, but approximately 10 or so Stearman base there. And there are some great, great pilots there uh, Ross and Rod and Joe are flying here, and we took off and went over El Dorado Lake, and um, and and they had uh, they intentionally put smoke on. By the way, um, I I left the stabilizer of our airplane in so that you could see where where I kind of placed it, and and uh, again was directing them on an inside or a right hand turn so that we could see where the smoke came from. This was a purposely planned and briefed shot. And I simply retouched out the horizontal stabilizer of the Bonanza that I'm in um, so that you never knew it was there. And it was very easy retouch. I mean, literally took seconds to, to get rid of it. So this is with the wider lens. And then <clears throat> I stacked them behind us with more of the, the telephoto, the, the uh, 70 to uh, 
200, both shots I just love. And the guys, you know, when you're flying with great pilots, um, you know, they, they really make your job easy. So uh, again, we're on a slight right-hand orbit. You can see by the way the smoke is trailing behind us. Um, but I twisted the camera just a little bit more also just to add the uh, the motion to the to the wings. Well, this is my uh, my my good buddy Scott Slocum and one of the finest uh, aerial photographers out there. Um, he's he's he does great work. There's a lot of his work that I see that I wished I could put my name on, and uh, and he's he does uh, some um, oh classes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, all of a sudden I can't think of the right term for it, but where he he uh, trains uh, other photographers um, how to safely and successfully do air-to-air -air photo shoots. And then he flies them. Um, and there have been times where I've kind of assisted him on uh, on this. So I wanted you to see the big opening of the Bonanza with both doors off, um, with two uh, of the photographers uh, aft facing strapped in. You can see they're safely strapped in. and. Uh, and Scott's about to to go flying with them. Uh, sometimes we've flown together, um, and uh, and here we are up at Reno actually uh, doing a shoot. But uh, there are other times where I would simply hire him. He has a Baron and a Bonanza, both with belly holes uh, STC um, that allow us to shoot straight down, and the double doors off of the right hand side and a special openable window on the left hand side, um, and we did this this shoot in the Indianapolis area of uh, Lyft Academy's um, diamond airplanes. And you talk about uh, flying with dissimilar performing airplanes. This was an amazing challenge. And I, I have to say, we started out with the little guys first and then, and then the Embraer 175 um, showed up uh, uh, and it was it was like this monster refrigerator just came into view and and uh, they hung in beautifully. We did a shallow left hand turn because if they're on the outside of the whip, whoever's on the furthest part of the whip on on a turn um, actually add has to add more power. And so that helped with uh, with the performance dissimilarity. Um, so we're we're in an orbit. And so the lighting changes, you can see as we go through the orbit. And uh, and again, um, amazing formation work. So <clears throat> shooting, and I've shot uh, Doc, our prize B-29 based here in Wichita. I've shot it both from Ed McElhaney's Bonanza as well as Scott Slocum's. Um, and sometimes I like to crop and again, twisting the camera to make it look like he's climbing and then twisting the camera to make it look you know, like he's descending, something like this would work well as a cover of a magazine, for example. And um, yet I love simple backgrounds um, like uh, El Dorado Lake again. So from the Bonanza, speaking of lakes, we can shoot down on top of airplanes. Here we have a Kodiak on floats. We can also do that pull up, which you saw earlier with the CJ3 Plus. Here we are shooting a specially equipped Bonanza that has, uh, I don't know what that is, hanging off the bottom. Um, but you can also shoot some pretty fascinating warbirds with the doors off, again, going into a slight left-hand orbit. Now, this would be kind of a classic formation, but as they were forming up, um, I shot this and I really like that for a change. You know, it's it's kind of has a little more personality to me. So sometimes when you're shooting images, don't don't forget to uh, to shoot some stuff, even if it wasn't what you initially had in mind. Well, four P-38s, uh, how, how can you go wrong? And here are a gaggle of uh, bear cats. The bear cat uh, actually came into uh, being after World War II, um, an incredible, incredible airplane. And here we have some jugs, the P-47. Again, here's a case where 
Um, they were just kind of getting into position, but I think this is a really cool shot um, rather than just the standard everyone looks the same. Now, there's an interesting thing when you're shooting formation flights. It's much more difficult, you can imagine, than just shooting one airplane because, um, you know, I mean, for the obvious reasons. But one of the fascinating things is that if the whole flight is in fairly close to you, then you have to put a wider angle lens on and the plane that's closest to you becomes substantially larger than the planes that are that are at the back of, of the gathering, of the formation. Um, so there are times when we'll ask the whole formation to move further away from us than they would normally fly so as to keep their relative sizes approximately the same, which is what we did in this case. And this was last year at Oshkosh. You may notice that one of the Mustangs um, has uh, an extra part to it. <laughs> so the twin Mustang in the middle um, is, uh, is being, uh, uh, being flown in from, from the left canopy. Um, and, and if you look at all the noses of the Mustangs along with the left nose of the, of the twin Mustang, um, you, you can see uh, that, that uh, they're flying great formation. So this happens to be a Baron. This is the twin en engine version of the Bonanza. You know, they used to come, both come off the line here in Wichita and the fuselage was, was the same. And at a certain point, um, Barons went to the right and Bonanzas went to the left and they got different wings with different engines and different noses. And so this fuselage is the 58 model Baron, which has the same basic fuselage as the um, uh, as as the model uh, 36. So <clears throat> if you if you haven't been to uh, Ron Fagan's museum, the Fagan Fighters World War II Museum up in Minnesota, in Western Minnesota, Granite Falls. Um, you really are missing something. It's pretty incredible. Um, just like Jerry Yagan's uh, Military Aviation Museum has an incredible collection, uh, Ron Fagan and, uh, and his son Evan and the family have created an amazing museum, an amazing collection. We were up there uh, doing a shoot and, uh, and we had not planned on doing air to air, but it snowed and he decided that he wanted to get out and, and, uh, and shoot uh, one of his Mustangs uh, over the fresh snow. So it was five degrees. I'm in a borrowed uh, snowmobile outfit. You can see there's a deflector, which is a required piece of equipment on a model 58 Baron if the, if you lose an engine, uh, it keeps you from gulping too much air into the opening. And, uh, and there I am at facing about ready to go up at five degrees with the wind chill of who knows what and shoot the Mustang. Now it's a polished Mustang and we're in a left-hand turn. And so the polished side of the Mustang is actually reflecting off the snow down below. So this is uh, Evan. Uh, Ron's, who was, Ron was flying, uh, Father Ron was was just flying the Mustang. This is Evan, his son, who's inverted. Um, actually, I should have inverted it the other way so that the the citations were inverted. But at any rate, um, the 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 Fagan folks um, are uh, are into construction of huge projects, and um, and and they use the citations as tools to get their crews out to to uh, the sites and back that evening so that they can have dinner with their family and have a quality of life that, uh, that general aviation affords. So again, from a Baron, you can get all kinds of cool shots. Another airplane, another platform that we shoot from is uh, the 206, the Cessna 206. And again, you can see me in the position there. Uh, and from the 206, again, we can get shots like this. This happens to be um, of the Airshare's uh, Phenom 300 
Um, that's Wichita below there. You probably recognize it. And I love this kind of light. I call it liquid light. It looks like someone poured liquid Crisco or something on the airplane. And the sheen is just spectacular. You still get to see detail, but it's just a romantic look. Um, again, from uh, the 206, we can shoot shots like, like these guys. Well, you may have noticed that the 206, the Baron, and the Bonanza have doors that are removable on the right-hand side of the airplane, but the Piper products remove the doors on the left side of the airplane. So if you wanted to shoot the other side of the airplane exclusively, you'd use a Piper product as your platform. And I'm not sure who this young kid is with all that dark hair, uh, emphasis on all and dark, um, but this was early in my career where you can see I'm strapped in and you can get an idea of how windy it can get back there in, in the opening. Uh, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I don't recall if this is a T-tail Piper Lance or a Saratoga, but it's one of those kind of Piper products. So you may notice the, uh, uh, the, the Piper product again, left-hand side doors off, and I'm sharing the, uh, the platform with Roger Tonry, who's an outstanding cinematographer and uh, assistant Scott, and, uh, and I'm going to be shooting stills. You probably notice the FAA approved uh, deflector that uh, is, is on, the, uh, on the front of this Seneca, Piper Seneca. Um, I know it looks like cardboard, but uh, I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's all authorized. And this is what it looks like in flight. And we happen to be in Australia and shooting uh, Global Express over the Sydney Opera House, both at sunrise and sunset. Pretty fun. And I get paid to do this. So again, from the Piper uh, open doors, shooting the right-hand side of the target ships, uh, I can shoot this TBM 850 um, with a bit of a telephoto lens. Well, uh, Cessna at one point had a caravan, a, a Cessna 208, that has uh, movable windows or removable or openable windows. You can kind of see up here, and I'll show you a close-up version in a minute. But this gives you an idea of how much gear we loaded in it to shoot both video and stills. And here's Roger again. We team up frequently on projects. And you can see the openable window on the left-hand side there is now in the down position, hinged down. It was a special STC. And Roger set up to shoot some video and we kind of uh, traded places in shooting. But here you can see him in position shooting. And <clears throat> these are some of the kinds of shots that we got. You know, and I have to remember to always shoot vertical and horizontal. Um, and interestingly enough too, the new cameras that we're shooting are so good. The quality is so incredible. This 5DSR 51 megapixel is so much fun to shoot. I have to force myself to shoot wider than I normally would, not knowing how the art director or the client might end up using the pictures, or I might in a book or uh, in some other form. Um, and with the croppability of the incredible cameras, um, you can, uh, you can get uh, get a lot out of an image by shooting just a little bit wider. So I was doing a shoot a few years back with, with Lee Lauterbach and Max Chapman. Max owned a, a number of airplanes, including a Mustang and, and a Corsair. And <clears throat> we were going to be shooting up around the Teton area. Um, and I said, well, what am I going to shoot from? And we kind of combined a vacation and photo shoot together. Gail came up with me. and. And he says, oh, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So it turns out I was going to shoot from a stagger wing. Well, I'd never been in a beach stagger wing before. And, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I believe this is Bob Hoff. Um, and uh, a great guy and a great pilot and, and a beautiful airplane. And I said, well, Bob, can you take the doors off? I, and he says, no, no, I, re I really can't. And he says, but I can roll down the pilot's window and... Uh, like an old car cranked window, and you can shoot out uh, out of it, and um, and we'll we'll uh, 
I said, okay, that'd be fine. That'd be fine. But that would be in trail if we put them in the lead. I said, how, you sure I can't shoot out the, remove the door? And he says, well, no, but he says, you know, sometimes when I'm flying, the door just pops open. I said, really? <laughs> he says, yeah, and it stays open, you know, in flight and, and uh, open a handful of inches. And I said, so you're okay if I open the door and kind of Put my knee against it to keep it open against the wind and and shoot out the opening and so oh, yeah sure no problem so this is the shot we got or one of the shots we got pretty incredible so here's a steerman where um ira rucker was the second owner of two steerman uh, uncle sam was the first owner and ira is flying me he's in the back you can see him and i'm up front uh, great portrait with the fisheye lens um, but from the open cockpit, and it's kind of awkward to turn around, but I did and got uh, this uh, uh, Fokker triplane uh, that uh, Dick Curtis, who ironically at the time was an engineer flying, uh, engineer working on the Citation 10, the fastest civil airplane. And on the weekends, he built and flew this Fokker triplane also shot from one of Ira's steermen on our way home one night. Again, from the steermen, it's really awkward turning around. I must say uh, it, was, uh, it was really tough. Uh, PT-22, love that airplane, great airplane, beautiful airplane. Uh, there are times when I have to shoot through canopies and <clears throat> this was again a little earlier in my career. You can see the mustaches, uh, a slightly different color than it is now. And uh, and the plan was to, uh, let's see, um, the plan, I assume everything's still going fine. Um, the plan was to shoot through the canopy as we did some formation work. Um, and I wore black gloves, black shirt, uh, um, put black tape on the leading edge of, of my uh, lens so I don't scratch the canopy and taped over cannon so it wouldn't reflect, and then they give me a white helmet. But as it was, was able to get a shot like this as we did formation loops. I also did some formation loops a few years later with Lee Lauterbach flying me in a Mustang, a P-51 Mustang, and this was part of the formation loop. We're pulling about four Gs in these loops, and I must say it's challenging doing the, the shoots for someone who doesn't do it all the time. Well, another platform that we shoot from sometimes is a uh, periscope equipped Learjet. There are two of them in the States that I know of. Um, Wolf Air has one and Clay Lacey uh, has one. And this is Clay, the uh, second from the right. Uh, there's Roger Tonnery again, um, Scott next to me and myself and uh, pilots and art directors, and, and uh, we're about to go up and shoot. I don't usually shoot from uh, the Learjets, um, but there are times when the extra speed it gives us is really nice, um, and, uh, and, and when they're primarily shooting uh, video or motion, um, then I can come along and shoot stills at times. Um, Chad Slattery is also a friend photographer of mine who shoots a lot of stills out of the Learjet through the power through the system as well as the windows. You may notice that I have my knee pads on and there are a lot of things that can hurt you cr crawling around in that airplane. So knee pads are really a nice bonus. So this is what it looks like inside with all the video gear set up. Um, and this is again what it would look like with the target planes formed up on the Learjet. I'm actually shooting obviously from another airplane. I've had people ask me, am I in another airplane when I'm shooting these pictures? And the answer is yes. So this is in Hawaii. Uh, they took the Learjet over to Hawaii and I did some shooting um, from, uh, uh, from it um, and uh, through the windows as we pass by some of the landmarks in Hawaii. So, you know, you've seen a lot of groups of people that it takes to make a photo shoot happen. And again, um, I got involved with Roger 
doing primarily the video and I came along in the Learjet and did some shooting for the new paint scheme when Southwest introduced the new paint scheme. Uh, all of these last few platforms that I've shown you are me shooting through canopies and the trick is to minimize your reflections. So if you have to shoot through canopy, again, wear black gloves or something black, get the camera as close to perpendicular to the window as possible and, uh, and watch out for reflections. So this happens to be a platform that is, I believe it's called an Impala. Uh, it was a, I wanna say an Italian trainer. And from it, here I am, this was obviously shot from, in this case, Clay's Learjet because he was going to be shooting some video and I was shooting stills and uh, an information with the three Learjets. Again, seeing what it takes to get this done safely and all. Well, here I am with the entire Brazilian Air Force, I believe, um, with the uh, C, oh, is it a, all of a sudden I'm drawing a blank. Um, I'm sorry, whatever it is. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and I don't know all my military airplanes, I apologize, but we were down in Brazil and, uh, and from C-130, I believe it is. And so um, from the back of the C-130, they can lift the ramp up and like that, and, or leave the, the bottom part of the ramp up and you can go faster um, or they can lower it. Um, but in this case, they left it up. You can see the videographer and I are stationed in the back and we're flying over the Amazon shooting these special FLIR equipped and all kinds of crazy stuff hanging off of them airplanes. Uh, another briefing situation with uh, Rod Lewis and, um, and uh, Doug Rosendahl, um, uh, Huff Stutler and Hinton and, uh, and uh, Allen and all, all kinds of folks um, shooting uh, some of Rod's collection. Uh, Rod flying La Pistolera and Glacier Girl, the famous P-38 in the background. I believe Steve Hinton was flying it. So another case where um, where I'm shooting out of uh, a C-130, I'm sorry, it's a little out of order from the other, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like inside as we had three Mustangs come up behind us, followed by and joined by the Thunderbirds. So that was pretty fun. Here's a third situation with the C-130 and leaving the ramp up again for higher uh, speeds. This is uh, around the Reno air show time. And here you can see uh, Scott Slocum was up there with me along with a handful of other photographers and uh, Rod Lewis provided two Tiger Cats um, chasing him in Glacier Girl, the P-38 and we're able to get some very cool shots. Okay, so I've shown you a lot of platforms and I know many of you know me more from shooting from the B-25. Um, I've had the opportunity to shoot out of 20 different B-25s over the years. Um, and uh, here I am in, in front of, uh, again, Rod Lewis's uh, Russian to get you B-25, a beautiful restoration. And I wanna show you some stuff uh, of the B-25, um, but in the meantime, um, I'm going to exit the screen for a second, and I'm going to play a nine minute video that I think for any of you who joined us late, gives you a great overview of uh, what it takes to pull off a uh, serious air-to-air -air production of both video and stills. And <clears throat> it's a production that was put together by um, the FlexJet people and um, and you'll you're gonna you're gonna love it. Uh, Ryan Gush who uh, was involved in production along with Lauren Florian and they did a really cool job.
650 FX. Go ahead for engine start. Alright, we'll go ahead and fire up. Startmaster. Fuel system panel. Flight controls. Transponders on. Checklist complete. Ready taxi. Alright, photo one, uh, 650 FX. We're ready when you are. I think we're going to get started. Welcome everybody. So today, uh, the first thing we're going to go through is basically Formation Flying 101, just to get everybody briefed up on uh, calls and uh, coordination that we use to uh, get through this process. Primary, we have two airplanes that we'll be doing photo work off of. Um, the B-25 is the uh, first one we'll talk of. And there's three camera positions. The nose position, we do some photo work from. And then off the back, um, there's Paul, he's a photographer. Anyhow, uh, that's where Paul will be sitting in the back. And obviously with his clear view, he can get all sorts of great photos from his vantage point. Shooting air to air is a very specialized endeavor. And there aren't that many of us in the world who do air to air shoots. In a sense, I'm a director. I'm directing a ballet, an aerial ballet. You know, we're moving, we're changing, we're, uh, we're working with new pilots, we're looking at different backgrounds and all. It's an incredible team effort that has to uh, work smoothly and work well. You know, it's inherently a dangerous situation. And that's why we love flying with great pilots because I know I'm gonna come home safely and I'm gonna come home with the product and everyone does the job. It becomes um, something we're all proud of. As you'll see, the guys got more comfortable bringing the plane further forward. Okay. Um, as the as the shoot continued. Okay. We, we do different things, whether it's a print ad. Or okay. And you'd rather have it in front or back here? Well, the creative aspect starts months in advance, but the overall picture from the day before, like the creative brief and the pilot brief, uh, it's pretty in depth. Where are we going? Okay. So. Um, we're sort of getting in the groove here. I think you guys are feeling it. We're seeing a change in how you're flying. Things are making sense, and we're starting to fine tune how we're working. Uh, for the Learjet, we've been swapping leads. There's a lot of variables. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of variables doing this uh, as opposed to working on a set where you have control and you can plan everything out to the nth degree and go on and light it, shoot it exactly the way you, you picture it. So that's sort of the frustration in that you can't plan it out exactly. You have to be very flexible and you have to be able to see things as they pop up and see the value of them. You call those uh, moments of opportunity. If you have an extremely well coordinated and well laid out brief, you're bound to end up with something good. We're taking basically our own film set, we're taking it flying. We have a lot of freedom with that film set. We're setting shots up and lighting and composure, so our set is constantly changing. We're covering a lot of ground. I will communicate to the pilots exactly where I want them, and if they can't put the airplane safely and quickly where I want, then we'll never get the shot. So the pilots are really the heroes of the plane. For them to just be in the right position and all is very tense work. Can you guys uh, give me a little throttle up here? If you feel comfortable tightening up from there, that's an amazing spot with the sun behind you. Up to you. You got it. It's very unique and very out of the ordinary from what we normally do every day. It's much more focused, and the concentration required is pretty significant. It's still incredible. That thing's pretty big in the windshield, but you take a photo of it, and it looks, still looks like it's pretty out there. Yeah. People would be like, yeah, you weren't that close. Most pilots spend their careers 
trying to stay away from other airplanes in the air, whereas we're doing just the opposite. Stay away from San Francisco. Uh, Flexjet does not need bridge shots or city shots. We're doing nondescript beauty shots. We don't need a cloud surfing shot or vortice shot, but we're gonna just brief that really quick in case the opportune moment shows up and we're able to get it. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically, as the air comes off the wings, um, it goes out to the side and swirls. And if we dip down with you at our six o'clock, gravity will take care of revealing the vortices as we're above the cloud layer. Everything's so uh, tranquil and, and awesome, and there's a lot of this floating and beauty and sparkles. And meanwhile, outside we're doing 300 miles an hour and we're going real fast. It just seems really calm. There's something so romantic about aviation, always has been. It allows you to go places and fulfill dreams and all. It's exhilarating. I love it. Some of the best stuff I've ever shot. Yeah. Let's go back. Yep, it's a wrap. Nice job, everyone. You know, when you're flying, you never get a sense of how fast you're going until you're right on top of a cloud layer and they're whizzing by, that's, that's still the part of it that it's never got old for me. I love shooting air to air. I love the process of being up in the airplanes, seeing things from a different perspective. I love the challenge of creating something that I hope is viewed as art. And I hope to evoke an emotion from whoever looks at these pictures. I want them to stop and look at that picture and say, Wow, I wonder where that airplane's going. And, uh, and I know that uh, I've eaten up a fair amount of my time. I'm going to race through what is uh, the, next, uh, the next part of the uh, program, which is the B-25. As I mentioned to you, I've shot out of 20 different B-25s. You can see the gaggle of folks that it takes. The nose on this special photo fanny B-25 that's based out of the Plains of Fame Museum in Southern California allows us to shoot from behind another airplane and change the lead. So now we're flying off of the target airplane. So different kinds of communication, but basically I'm still directing the aerial ballet. And by the way, wasn't that video incredible? I thought that Flexjet did 
just a super job on that. Um, I guess they've won some awards on it. It's just recently been released and uh, hats off to the guys for doing that. So these are again from the nose of the B-25. So we can follow in on final and get shots that you just can't get any other way. The second position on the B-25 is the emergency exit or the escape hatch that's aft of the bomb bay on the right hand side. And from there, you can shoot down. You have no idea how much it costs us to get that fog just right over the Golden Gate Bridge there, but, uh, but it was well worth it. And here's a case where, I don't know if Bud is watching or not, but <clears throat> Bud Anderson is flying here. And I did the shoot with him when he was 81 years old, flying Old Crow, the Mustang named after him, that's, that uh, is owned uh, now by Jim Hagedorn, but at the time was owned um, by Jack Roush. And, uh, and, and we did this incredible uh, photo shoot. And this was shot from the, uh, from the waist position of the B-25. But my favorite place is the tail of the B-25. And as I mentioned, 20 different B-25s, 20 different configure, well, not 20 different configurations, but very different configurations. Um, each can remove a portion of the tail, some can remove more. So here's the Planes of Fame and they've done a special um, configuration where I can sit back there uh, in the open. I again am tethered in. Um, Tom Jenkins, who's been with me for many, many years, uh, assisting me in this case. Uh, you can see him also um, just uh, forward of me uh, as we're shooting uh, 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 an airplane around the the Red Rock area of Arizona. So this is what it looks like when a plane pulls up behind the, the B-25 and there I am sitting in the tail. Um, and from there, I have a great, great vantage point. Pretty fun. Well, because the tail sticks out beyond any other part of our airplane, I can put a fisheye on and get a shot like this. Or I can put a telephoto on and get something like this. Again, uh, for those of you who may be tuned in late, uh, I try my best whenever possible to have a diagonal element happening in the photograph rather than just flying straight and level. In this case, you can tell by the exhaust that we are actually in a, a slight left-hand turn, but I probably accentuated it a bit, knowing that I couldn't see the horizon and who knows you know, what angle he really is uh, flying at. <clears throat> this is a case again, earlier I showed you a shot where uh, the plane pulled up through the six o'clock position. Um, he's not staying there because he's blind to us, um, but he's pulling up uh, in, 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 or sliding across one or the other. So these are all from the tail of the B-25. How much fun is it that I get to shoot? Here's two P-51 Mustangs and a, and a P-38, you know, flying around the California coast. Just amazing. So this was a, a neat, um, a neat shot where you can see the P-51 through the booms of the, uh, uh, of the P-38. Well, we love beautiful backgrounds, uh, obviously Lake Powell and Monument Valley in this case, uh, the Tetons, the West Coast, uh, you know, they all offer incredible backgrounds. And whenever we have clouds, we love getting on top of the clouds. Well, this is kind of fun. This is a 757 with a test bed engine, or it's a test bed with an engine. I think it's maybe one of the Challenger possibly engines that they were testing for a Honeywell. Um, we met them in flight over uh, Catalina Island. They had taken off from and returned to their home base in the Phoenix area. These are all from the tail of the B-25. I love graphic looking backgrounds whenever possible.
And again, I'm trying to play light against dark and dark against light. So the reflection of the sky prior to sunrise on the fuselage of this Gulf Stream, um, and then asking them to turn their lights on to, uh, to add a, a lot more life to the picture. This happens to be one of the few shots where straight and level, I think, works really well. But there we go again with more Gulf Stream shots with them on the inside turn. In a sense, we're turning right here. We're in a right-hand orbit. And there are times when, uh, again, inside turn, this, this time it's a left-hand orbit. And uh, for those, again, who may have just recently joined us, a 24 to 105 on my Canon 5DSR it would have captured this shot. Early morning, I've got a uh, an 85 millimeter 1.2 beautiful, beautiful lens um, <clears throat> that allows me to shoot low light. Um, so you can imagine to actually see the lights on inside of the airplane and the telltale light too, um, we're way before sunrise when I'm shooting this. So I've had to force myself to shoot wide. Um, here's a case where this camera is so incredible that I could crop a vertical out of this and blow it up. Um, and normally I like to shoot where I have room in front of the airplane, but I shoot it both ways because I could use this as a two page spread uh, in, in some promotional piece down the road. And maybe they want to inset or overlay copy on the right hand page or whatever. So I shoot it with the airplane small in the frame on the left side, on the right side, vertical, horizontal, zoom in, zoom out, and try and get as much variety as I can in a short period of time. Using lights to set up uh, shots on the ground, um, we've done that for decades. Um, you know, I'm officially a, a commercial photographer. I shot everything from pizzas for Pizza Hut, the Coleman camping gear and all over the years, but about 20 years ago, I said to Gail, I, you know, I think I just want to shoot airplanes. I love it. I get paid more. I have more fun. I'm a happier husband. I'm, you know, let's just concentrate on, on aviation. And I've been really fortunate and blessed to, uh, to be able to do that. So, um, so I said, well, we should be able to take the strobe into the sky too, and, uh, and light up the planes with the strobe in the air. So that's what these airplanes rep represent. So I do have a couple of uh, books that are still in, in print, uh, on Air to Air Warbirds and uh, Air to Air Mustangs and Corsairs. You can contact me uh, and I'd be happy to personalize uh, books to y'all. Um, uh, we used to have a Warbirds calendar. Unfortunately, we, we, uh, it just didn't work out um, uh, and stopped it in, in 2015. Well, I can see that my time is, uh, is pressing on and it's really, about time for for questions, but I'm going to take about three more minutes and emphasize that, as I said at the very beginning of the presentation, I have the best job in aviation. And one of the great things, of course, you've seen is that I get to shoot beautiful airplanes. I get to go to great backgrounds and all, um, get to fly with great pilots, but I also have had the opportunity to meet heroes and make some of them friends. And so, um, so I'm going to show you some of the people, and I know some of you who are in some of these pictures are, are actually listening, and and uh, and it's been my honor to call you guys friends, and and uh, to be humbled, to be uh, uh, to have received some honor uh, in halls of fame with you guys too, because uh, let's face it, you guys are 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 real heroes, and I I want to acknowledge that. My first Oshkosh fly-in was in 1976, and that's Bob Hoover, the late, great, amazing, amazing pilot. Now, we could do a whole program just on him. And he treated me that day as if I was the most important guy he was going to meet that day. And he was explaining the laminar flow wing on the Shrike Commander that he'd just flown an air show on at uh, Oshkosh in 1976. Um, he honored me with... Uh, doing the foreword for my third book, which was the Warbird book that you just saw. And we got a chance to fly with our dear friend, Mike Herman, who became uh, 
Bob's uh, oh, uh, chauffeur, I guess, is as good a term as any, but but m much more than that, of course. And and uh, there were times when they would fly from the West Coast and swing into Wichita and pick Gail and me up and head up to to uh, Oshkosh, um, and we got to hear uh, stories uh, as we were flying in Mike's uh, CJ3. Pretty incredible. And uh, for Bob's 90th birthday, a bunch of us gathered at the Hangar Hotel in Breckenridge, Texas. Um, I wish I could take the time to acknowledge everyone who's in this picture, but what an amazing few days that was. Um, you'd be surprised, but we actually uh, uh, saw Bob in the bar and uh, at the hotel. And Gene Cernan had been a dear friend for years of Gales and mine. And, and there he is, the last man on the moon. Um, in the blue shirt and uh, greeted us with hugs and, and introduced us uh, with a nice introduction to his buddy on the right, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. And so here's the first and the last man on the moon honoring their hero at Bob Hoover's 90th birthday. So we took that image and added the moon uh, through Photoshop and, uh, and we uh, uh, were honored to, uh, to have been able to do that. Um, when Bob passed away, uh, some of his friends who you see noted here down below purchased ads to run in magazines and it says the greatest example of being the greatest example and certainly Bob Hoover was that. Well, Bud Anderson is the currently high ranked living ace from World War II. He's a triple ace. And the question is, how do you know if someone's a fighter pilot? Well, you you look to see how they use their hands when they're talking. What a great guy Bud is. Just, uh, he's family to Gail and me. I've, I've kiddingly said, if Gail disappears someday, I know where to find her. She's at Bud's. Tex Hill, another uh, great, great history there. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm gonna race through this because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm eating up a lot of time, but uh, Harrison and I were, honored to uh, be named in the um, 51 uh, legends of, of, uh, of aviation, which uh, the num number one was, was Neil Armstrong, number two were the Wright brothers and so forth. And um, it was based on, I think a number of things, if we excelled in a certain part of aviation and or if we had an effect that brought even non-aviation folks closer to aviation, which is, I think why, why I was honored because hopefully I can capture some of what we pilots uh, get to uh, understand and appreciate and share that with, with those of you who, who don't. And so we were at a party honoring, uh, honoring Hoover and Beverly Hills uh, a few years back. And uh, I was actually uh, number 47 out of 51 and Harrison, excuse me, I was, yeah, I was 47 and he was 48. And uh, we had the hardest time, it was very late in the morning, we had the hardest time figuring out what 47 and 48 looked like on our fingers, but that's what we came up with. Now I came up with a list of 40 people that just immediately who I felt deserved it more than I did. And I wish I had time to name them all, but I think you can all read um, who's on this list. And these are people whom I personally had a chance to know some as very close friends and, and others, uh, just uh, in a more passing way, um, but they all had effects on my life, and uh, and I truly felt that each of them had the uh, <laughs> deserved to have been named prior to mine uh, having been named. And so here you can see some more of my heroes, uh, some of whom I've I've mentioned. Russ Meyer is shown up there. He was the, he's the chairman emeritus of uh, Cessna. And uh, he's my overall hero he, uh, for a family man and, and for what he's uh, accomplished uh, in his career and life. Um, but you can see so many other close friends here who, uh, who I, uh, I, I have cherished their friendship and, uh, and hopefully am honoring them in a slight way just right now. Well, here are some of the key people uh, beyond those who you may have seen there because um, of the, People who were listed in the 51 included Arnold Palmer, Hal Shevers, John Glenn, Burt Rutan, uh, Dale Klapmeyer, Al Yulshi, Hoover, 
Jaeger and uh, Paul Poperesny, along with Neil Armstrong, I mentioned. Um, and uh, Palmer, what a great guy. He, uh, he honored me with doing the foreword to my very first book. Jack Roush, what a super guy. John Glenn shared uh, dinner with Gail and me at the Wright Brothers uh, Centennial celebration. Uh, Jim Lovell and uh, and Gene. Gene was had become very close. Sadly, we lost him a few years back at 82. And um, Neil Armstrong was 82 also when he passed. Sidney Pollack um, was a Citation 10 driver, and uh, and and uh, many of you know him from the industry. Carol Shelby. Um, uh, and a great, great movie about him. This was at Reno. Uh, Louis Zamperini, the subject of Unbroken, the book and movie. I knew him when I was a teenager and we uh, happened to be in LA for his first book signing um, and, uh, and had a great time reminiscing. Dick Cole, uh, the last of the uh, Doolittle Raiders. This was at Oshkosh. And um, this is uh, Jerry Yellen, who flew the last mission um, during World War II as a Mustang pilot. And uh, th that was uh, in, in Hawaii, uh, celebrating, uh, not celebrating, commemorating uh, the attack on, on Pearl Harbor, um, where uh, we also had a chance to meet and, and spend a little time with Garth and Tricia. Um, they couldn't have been any nicer. Well, I do get to play a little bit. I mentioned I have 25 legally logged hours from many years ago. Um, and there I am in the B-25 and I got to uh, fly the, the uh, Mustang doing a loop. I pulled a little too hard. Um, <laughs> Ed Volan, uh, great guy, sure miss him. Um, and, uh, uh, but this is what it looks like when we do the pull-ups. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, this is what it looks like inside the cabin when we do the pull-ups. So we trust our pilots. Sometimes we trust them too much. We told them to make a low pass, not quite that low. Well, as I'm closing now, um, I'm gonna close with some vortices shots. Here is um, one that Canon used uh, in, in an ad. Uh, we get the vortices shots usually over the marine layer off the California coast. Um, it's usually relatively smooth. This happens to be over Lake Tahoe. Um, and it's fascinating. I know I can set it up, but I can't control it. So I'm a little bit along for the ride. Um, but it's a great ride. Here, here we are closing out with some Gulfstream shots. Just pretty amazing. And a Learjet. So I believe that you're all going to agree that I have the best job. And when I get asked what's my favorite all-time airplane photograph, this is it. And Bud Anderson uh, signed this print for Charlie, one of our grandsons, when he was 13 months old. And he looks like he just is wearing that airplane. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that the grandkids uh, uh, get involved in aviation. Certainly, they love it. And, um, and as I mentioned, I believe that I have the best job in aviation. So, um, I'm, I'm gonna set up some pictures. I know it's been 90 minutes um, and uh, they officially set up a two hour slot. I've probably answered most of your questions that you're gonna ask. I will say that um, someone's gonna probably ask me, how do, how do you get started as an air to air photographer? And I was an assistant to a photographer. Um, I'm gonna go black here for a minute and then, and then uh, set up another screen, um, but I was a, an assistant to a, a photographer who had the, um, the account uh, with, uh, with Cessna 
and um, and I uh, and for a dollar seventy five an hour, I loaded his cameras and um, and ended up uh, uh, learning what it was like to be a uh, uh, a, a commercial photographer. And that's how it started. So I'm going to go ahead and start a little screen going here that's just going to, in a minute, be in the background. I came to Wichita actually to direct a crash pad at a halfway house that was sponsored through a church in town. And I'm a, I'm a believer in a biblical principle of uh, receiving and giving or giving and receiving. And, that, and that, you know, I came here to give. I, I earned my degree in zoology from UC Santa Barbara and didn't know what I was going to do for a living, was an avid amateur photographer and came to direct a halfway house. I'd been involved in a church in Hollywood in the 60s and decided to put my life where my mouth was a product of the 60s and and uh, and spent a year directing a halfway house and and then uh, one of the church members uh, got me the job for $1.75 an hour assisting a commercial photographer and I ended up uh, uh, in the, sh the short story is that uh, I, I gained a career I gained um, a bunch of friends, I gained a community um, and a family, and uh, and I gained more than I ever gave when I came here to, to give. So um, that's what brought me to Wichita. Uh, I will say that uh, I usually do answer emails or phone calls.
Okay. Okay. Um, we, we do have some questions here for you tonight. Paul, uh, before we get into the Q&A, I just wanted to say uh, we there's so many well wishes headed in, in your direction and in Gail's direction. Um, the, the question panel is just filled up with people expressing their uh, support for you, expressing their prayers and their thoughts kind of aimed in your direction. So we're definitely all, um, you know, kind of behind you guys in your battle against breast cancer. And uh, just let us know if there's anything anything more that we can do to be of help. I, th I think I speak for not only the whole team here at the museum, but the larger aviation community that uh, we will help however we can. That's really sweet. And I, and I truly appreciate that. And I know that, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting that the people I know in the aviation community have the character traits that I wanted my kids to have. And um, and so uh, thank you for the well wishes. And, and for those of you who uh, missed the very beginning, I kind of lost it at the beginning, uh, making it public that Gail has breast cancer, but is uh, it, it is not life threatening, just life altering for the next year through um, surgery and treatment. So thank you for the kind words. Thank you. If, if it's okay with you, we'll uh, get started with a couple questions here. Let's do it. So the first question asked was, uh, have, have the new generation of image stabilized cameras um, made the external gyro st stabilization units obsolete? Good question. No, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that they're in addition to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, jets are a lot easier to shoot because I can crank up my shutter speed. I don't have to worry about vibration from the camera platform that I'm in, the airplane that I'm in. And um, shooting uh, propeller-driven planes, we have to shoot a slower shutter speed, sometimes down to uh, oh, a, you know, a 60th of a second or so. And depending on the lens that you're using, um, the vibration from your airplane um, makes gives you a soft image. So the so when I'm shooting propeller-driven airplanes, I actually love to shoot the Kenyan gyros along with the image stabilized lenses. So I, I see them whenever possible uh, working in tandem. Okay, and uh, all the photographers out there will have to forgive me if I misspeak. I am not a photographer and I'm doing my best to relay some very technical questions. Um, Paul, if you have to keep your shutter speed at around one over 500 or less, what other alterations do you employ to maintain proper exposure? Yeah, sure. You know, well, it's an interesting thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, an old dog, and so I learned photography in the '60s um, when I had a purely manual camera, and so, and I happened to be math oriented, and so I, I you know, I kind of understood how that all worked pretty well. Um, <clears throat> when we, when, when the newer and current cameras came out, you know, you have all kinds of, you know, push here dummy uh, buttons and. And, uh, and settings, um, which are actually really nice and handy. And so what I have done over the last couple of years is I've actually, when I'm shooting a propeller-driven airplane, I have ended up putting it on time value or TV setting um, and let the aperture or the f-stop adjust itself to the correct exposure. And it was it's an easy way then to, I hate to call it bracket your exposure because you're not really bracketing exposure, but you're altering the shutter speeds by simply changing the shutter speeds, the f-stop will be automatic compensated for a correct exposure or close to a correct exposure. So I have in the last few years shifted to uh, a time value. I know a lot of my competitors like aperture value because the sharper part of the lenses tend to be around f8, f11. And um, and uh, and I, uh, you know, I'm more concerned with the vibration problem and the and the arc. I hope that answers that. I wouldn't be the one to ask if it did or didn't, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't see anything being re-asked here, so I think we're good. Um, do you ever shoot tethered when doing air-to-air -air work, uh, or are you always tethered, or do you sometimes use a parachute? Kind of. Um, yeah. What's the Sure, good question. Um, so uh, it, it's interesting, the very first time I shot from the B-25 was the first time I shot years ago um, with with uh, an open 
and and I asked the pilots, I said, well, do you give me a parachute? And they said, no, you either get strapped in really well or you wear a parachute and don't get strapped in at all because if I accidentally deployed the parachute um, while tethered in well, um, I'm gonna have a real problem and the airplane's gonna have a real problem. And so it's a one or the other when you have an opening like that. So I have always opted for the tethering in. Good question. We've actually got two questions here about two different kinds of tethering. Um, do you ever shoot tethered uh, when doing air to air work in such a way that a client or air director, art director can see the results kind of there as you're shooting? No, you know, I'll be quite honest. Um, you know, they hire me because that if it's a if it's a commercial job and not something for myself, they they hire me because they trust that I'm going to get them what they want. And the more input that they try to give to me as we're going, you know, 200 miles an hour or whatever, the least pro least productive I'll be uh, or less productive. And so, um, so no, I to be quite frank, <laughs> I don't I don't want them to to be uh, uh, art directing in the air other than visually giving me suggestions you know like hey there's a cloud over there can we go shoot around it or whatever and i'm open to art directors giving me input but not to the point of looking at the images and wasting time i mean it's very expensive operating these airplanes and and the light goes quickly so uh, so it's it's important that i that they trust me and i get the job done Okay, we've got a question here about the typical number of photos you might take and, and what that ratio looks like to the finished product. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a good question and it's one that I can't really answer except to say that when we used to shoot film, we had to bracket the exposure because we would shoot slide film or transparency film and you never knew exactly how the results were going to be because uh, you know, you're you're up flying the first hour of light or last hour of light, and the and you've got a white airplane, and the sun's hitting the airplane, but but the ground is dark, and you know, and your light meter's going to lie to you, and so forth. And so we used to bracket or alter the exposures so that something was going to turn out well in a given situation. Now we don't need to do that um, because uh, shooting raw images allows you on the computer afterwards to adjust um, to whatever you envisioned when you shot it. And you don't have to shoot multiple images with different exposures. So um, so I, I, uh, I can't remember the, all the details of the question, I apologize, but basically um, I, you know, I, I shoot, uh, uh, it depends on how long we have the airplane as to how long we get to shoot it. For example, you know, you're looking at, at when you're looking at these uh, corporate jet shots, we're up for an hour shooting uh, because they they don't get the airplanes very frequently and and uh, uh, they pull them out of service to for the photo shoot. Um, and especially with the jets, they're you know they they want to get as much as it can to be used for years. And we shoot vertical and horizontal and wide lens and and in your face and whatever you know and and you know try and get them as much variety as possible. So we overshoot. Um, when we're shooting commercial stuff and we may have them for an hour when we're shooting warbirds we may have them for 10 minutes and um and they're basically um you know used for you know calendars or or uh, books or you know or a magazine article and so um so consequently we shoot a lot less so the answer is i don't know how many i shoot you know but a lot and the, one of the other questions that someone may ask or be thinking is, um, now that we're shooting digital and we've been shooting full-time digital for, I don't know, 15 years or whatever, um, how much time do you have to spend editing afterwards? And we, we generally say for every day of shooting, we have two days on the computer. Um, sometimes it's more depending on how much you've shot, but that's, that's approximately. So I hope that kind of in a roundabout way answers that. Yeah, and I think it actually leads us to uh, another question, which is, do you, you do shoot digital, but do you have a soft spot in your heart for film? Not a bit. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. Um, I, I, now, my, my uh, interestingly enough, my 
at my office, um, at my desk, at my studio, I look out this picture window and there are two prints on each side of the window and they're both Ansel Adams black and white images, which I absolutely love. And, and certainly film was, was, uh, was fun, but no, I can do, I, I can get better results. You know, I had Hasselblads and, and uh, you know, four by fives and all kinds of stuff. And, and, you know, I can get better results out of my uh, 35 millimeter SLR, digital SLR, than I could uh, out of film. Okay, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you keep multiple aircraft in focus in those excellent formation shots? Sure, that's that's a t that's a tough one. So uh, what I end up doing, in fact, there's one right there, um, the three Bearcats. Um, uh, this is Stu Dawson's uh, uh, Sea Fury. What a cool airplane that is. Um, and it's what I end up doing is is I end up upping the ISO to maybe 400 or even 800. So I can get a little more depth of field for a given shutter speed. And for you techno geeks out there, you understand what I'm saying. Um, I also tend to shoot a little wider because again, with these great cameras, I can um, crop in and, and basically there are three things that, that affect what's called depth of field, which is what they're asking for, the amount of the image that appears in focus and from one airplane, say to the in front to the back airplane. It's the depth of the field, and and there are three things that affect that, and one of one of the things is uh, is, is the choice of the lens. And so if I go a little wider lens, I get more depth of field for the same settings as if I zoomed in. So um, so I tend to shoot a little wider, and then I'll crop in later. Um, so that's but I also bump up the ISO to get a little more depth of field. So, Paul, one of the things I think that the perhaps less technical among us are very curious about is obviously a lot of planning, briefing, preparation goes into getting the airplanes just where they are, where they need to be for these incredible shots. Um, how do you kind of cr get a sense of the kind of image that's going to support that particular airplane? Do you have to spend time with it and look at its lines and determine what sort of backgrounds and things will work with that? Or is it is it a more arbitrary process than that yeah it's really a combination of the two you know it depends if you're um if you're working uh for a project of your own um or if you're you know shooting for a manufacturer for their marketing you know that they may have an airplane that that they really want to feature its high altitude capabilities or they may want to really feature that it can go um you know from the west coast to hawaii um, so you pick a background that hopefully tells the story that they're wanting to tell. And then um, uh, there's a lot of planning with the marketing and advertising people ahead of time to make sure that you're, you know, creating not what you as the photographer want necessarily or the message, but what they want to convey. And uh, so then when you get to the location, um, you know, you can't plan the weather. And so, um, so here's a case. So over these clouds, that's a cool looking shot, you know, um, but uh, you, you, uh, you know, you take advantage of that um, when, when it's there, but, but you plan it as best you can. And then you go for the moments of opportunity um, that, that, uh, that appear. Paul, how much uh, of a challenge is dealing with air traffic control and, and how do you get the flexibility to maneuver the airplanes as needed? Sure. Well, ag again, thankfully, it's a real team effort as I've tried to emphasize through this whole evening and the pilots, again, are the heroes of the show and they do a lot of technical stuff. The briefings that we have are normally two-part. I normally start the briefing um, by saying, here's what we hope to achieve artistically and that may, depending on how many planes you're shooting, that might last, last uh, 15, 20 minutes. And then, um, and then basically the pilots take over and say, well, here's how we can do it safely and achieve what you want artistically. And so uh, they do all the contacts. There are times when um, they will get on the phone and contact air traffic control and tell them what we're planning on doing. And although, they know that what we're going to do is safe and legal and all. Um, they they 
uh, often will give, if we're going into a busy area like San Francisco or, well, San Francisco is a great example, then they, they get on the phone and they let the, the air traffic control folks know that we're coming in with, you know, a bomber, <laughs> a relatively low level circling around Alcatraz and we'll be there, you know, with uh, two jets or uh, whatever in tow and uh, and we'll be there about this hour and we'll be uh, departing out over the Golden Gate Bridge to do some work along the coast and so forth. So they love the heads up. It's not required uh, in most cases, but um, the pilots uh, do take care of that. You know, it's their license at stake too. And, and we don't want to tick off anybody. No, uh, unduly. Thanks, Paul. We've got a lot of questions emerging about the utility of uh, flash in air-to-air -air photography. Um, is there any danger at all that it would blind the pilot of the subject aircraft? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, <clears throat> the answer is no, um, but we brief that uh, in the briefing, and then I, we always let them know over the radios when I'm going to start shooting with the flash. So they're not surprised because they're in tight and they're they're if they're formed up on us, you know, it's it's uh you know it's tense work. And uh, these guys are concentrating. If all of a sudden they're distracted by this flash going off, um, then um yeah, that's that, you know that's not cool. So we no surprises. We don't want any surprises in the air. And so um so we alert them that we're going to be shooting and um and, and there's never, never been an issue. What I end up doing technically for the photographers out there is that I bump my ISO up again to around 800 or so. And I end up um, using a Canon flash that allows me to adjust the angle of the flash. So I go to the most telephoto setting on the flash and depending on how bright it is, if we're going into sunset, um, you know, we have to wait till the sun goes down and then we'll use it on manual. And then as it gets darker, we'll probably we'll generally switch to the ETTL mode and sometimes half power or whatever, you know, we, and it depends what we're looking for. Sometimes we want to really light up the, air, uh, the airplane. Other times we just want a hint just to open up the airplane, just to open up the shadows just a little bit. So there's one right there that's, that was used with the flash, for example. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I believe that it did. Um, Paul, what do you look for in a weather forecast to kind of assume the marine layer's suitability for your incredible vortices shots? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, we, um, I, you know, it's, it goes without saying we cannot control the weather. And <clears throat> you make all the plans you can, and then and then you live with what you've got. The good thing is we're mobile. You know, so if we're planning to go to L.A., and there's a storm coming into LA, um, but but uh, Seattle is open. Then we'll go to Seattle, and uh, you know, and vice versa. You know, and so we are mobile. And normally the marine layer um, doesn't go inland very far, so um, we'll try and base out of a, a slightly inland airport that can get us then on top and back of the layer, and then back to uh, to land uh, where where we wanted to. Um, the, the marine layer sometimes ends up uh, being off the coast, about 25 miles off the coast. So often uh, we will see it just on the other side of Catalina or the Channel Islands, both of which are 26 miles across the sea. So I think that's it. Well, um, that does conclude the Q&A period for this evening.